Bill this morning, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. William. Good morning again, Rob. A beautiful day. Crisp, but beautiful. New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. Mr. Gilstrap. Good morning. And as we've been doing during the course of uh, early voting season, welcoming in the county clerk, uh, Tony Petrucci. Tony, good morning to you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Are we still killing it with the early voting numbers? Well, for the, we had a real good week. Of course, it was four days last week. This week it'll be six. And we had uh, almost 11,000 people voted in just those four days. And uh, that was uh, a little bit over 2,600 people per day at those, at three locations. So real pleased with that. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping we can break 20,000. How was your Saturday turnout? Saturday was, was good. Uh, we had about 2,200 people, 2,289 to be exact, uh, to vote at the three polling places. We had 783 at the Bettyton location, 708 at the Dunn building, and 798 at Pikeside, which uh, actually has been coming on ever since uh, we started this year. Last year, or in May, it was it was a little, little low. I, I think it's just because of people not knowing that uh, – uh, where it was exactly, but uh, it was. I was up there Saturday at uh, oh eight thirty. The lines were all the way around back uh, of the uh, fire station, and the parking lot was packed. So they were they were ready to go. Uh, on Saturdays we don't start till nine. Uh, during the week it's eight to five. So yeah. Uh, yeah. But, you know. Tony, put in the eleven thousand in perspective. How many folks vote in the primary? Do you remember? We had about uh, out of the we've got about ninety five thousand registered voters. Of course, it was a, it's a little it was a little less than back in May because a lot more people was registered. We only had about eighteen percent. Yeah. Okay. So you expect me to yeah. do the math of ninety eighteen percent of ninety three? Eight, about eighteen thousand. Eighteen thousand. So you're getting pretty close to that eighteen thousand already. Yeah. Yeah, we're yeah. over you know almost eleven thousand just in the primary. Yeah. I mean, just in the early voting. Yeah. That, the the uh, the eighteen uh, percent you're talking about was for the total election back in May. Yeah, that's that that's was, what. Yeah, that's what I was getting. At. I was saying. Yeah, yeah, I was right, saying about right, the eleven right. eleven thousand is uh, already in early yeah. voting is a yes, encroaching yes, upon the yes, what you got in the primary. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When is the final day of early voting, Tony? Final day of early voting will be Saturday, this Saturday, from nine to five, and then, of course, uh, the the regular election, uh, November the fifth. Do you see a need in the future, Tony, to go to a fourth voting location anytime in the near future? Well, we, we, I've already been pondering that in my mind. What what's left of it here in the last few three days, and I, I firmly believe, yes, uh, probably something out uh, towards the Hedgesville area would probably be helpful for a lot of uh of our people um i suspect most of the people that's coming from the back creek to this back creek valley are probably going to pike side out of match or not yeah and then um some people in hedgesville area probably will be going either to bettington or downtown so mm -hmm. I, I i think that would be a, it would be helpful okay yeah. On Saturday afternoon, I voted at the Beddington station, and it was free and clear. Just kind of walked in, and and I guess I hit the sweet spot. And I ended up talking to the sheriff's deputy who was on duty there, and just said, you know, how yeah. how's the how's the yeah. crowd been? And he said it's been very polite, and but he told me something I didn't realize, and maybe people should know: you cannot wear a political T-shirt to when you go voting. I knew about electioneering, which to me always meant signs and and, and that kind That's of thing. Correct. But you can't wear That's a hat correct. or a, a Trump no. hat or Harris hat or a Trump. Sure. No, so no, keep that in mind. No. The only thing you can wear is a Notre Dame hat. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and they get moved to the front of the line. Yeah. That's that exactly right. That was an impressive and, performance and, Saturday, Tony. And you know, well, yeah. What's I want to go back to this. Um, forget my train of thought with the um, electioneering. Yeah, a lot of people didn't know that you could turn your shirt inside out if you wanted to come in. But uh, that is, that is uh, that is the law by the Secretary of State. 
um, that you cannot do that. And we haven't had any any major issues. Some people's come in and they've been very polite to take their hat off and and do what they have to do. But getting back to the football deal, if they wouldn't have lost to Northern Illinois, which I we talked about this the other day, I don't think Northern Illinois have won a game since. <laughs> so if if they wouldn't have lost that game, I think they automatically, even if they lose, if they'd have lost lose another one, that would have been one, one game they lost. They'd probably been in the playoffs, but they got a little ways to go yet. If they lose another game, they're out. Right. That's two games that they lose. You know, Tony, if you're trying to get some sympathy on that loss, forget it, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it was just, uh, you know, Marshall did the same thing to him a couple years ago, yeah. and Marshall didn't win a game the rest of the year. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I think that's true, Tony. I think you're. I think the boys at the sports mix were talking about that not too long ago. Hey, I understand today is your birthday. It is. Happy birthday. Forty-six. Forty-six. Yeah. <laughs> We'll we'll yeah. sing to you, Tony, and I'll lead it off by singing. Uh, I'm sure you you always did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But we're we're excited about it with this election. I'm real, we're really happy. I've, I've told everybody before the staff in there, the voter registration, did a great job. Poll workers, good. The sheriff's department, you couldn't ask for any better situation. Uh, along with Mike Lang, who's in charge of the bailiffs, uh, Gary Wine, and and uh, uh, Chase, who's now sort of over the uh, IT department doing a great job for us that if we have any problems with uh, um, issues. Uh, so, you know, so far so good. But, you know, we got a long way to go. In November 5th, uh, when Election Day is, will be the biggest day. So um, I'm just telling everybody to be ready, be hunkered down. And we're going to, you know, we'll have problems. But uh, I, I think we're prepared to uh, take, care of, take care of most of them. Thank you, Tony. By the way, it was Virginia Sign who's listening who tipped me off about your birthday. And she's Italian, so I always try to accommodate her wishes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we, Virginia, yes, she would know that. Yeah. yeah. We all yeah, try we, to accommodate Virginia's wishes. <laughs> uh, ab- absolutely. Thanks, Virginia. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Have a great birthday. You, you do the same. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye. That's Tony Petrucci, Berkeley County Clerk. And now here is Financial Phil, Phil McCoy from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad's Group of Financial Advisors on Winchester Avenue, Martinsburg. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, Rob. How are you, sir? I'm well. I, I saw you in a conversation with Dylan. Were you taking it easy on him like you promised? Because I did. I, I barely I, mentioned anything I about the Ravens' to... loss. Listen, I am – after Friday, and if anyone doesn't know that the Spring Mills Martinsburg game, which was a terrific game, there was technical difficulties, and Nick Berzellini and Dylan Bishop stepped up for the entire community, did an unbelievable job uh, still streaming that game, even though there was technical difficulties. They went on huddle, streamed it for everybody. Nick, poor Nick was at the studio by himself, and all of a sudden he's now commentating a game and streaming the game. Nick came in for help, and if I would have turned that on, I guess it was in the middle of the second quarter by the time Dylan got there, even, and even when Nick was alone, I wouldn't have known they were at the game. They did an unbelievable job, uh, and I'm sure to some extent unprepared for what they had to do and still brought that game to us. So I said, when I saw the Ravens lost yesterday, I had a really busy day. When I saw the Ravens lost, the first thing that popped in my head is, poor Dylan, he did such a great job, him and Nick both, and I'm sure Colin did – to, uh, from a distance at the game, but they did such a great job with that game. I feel bad for him. I am not giving that man a hard time. He did a tremendous job, and everybody that watched that game should send him a message and tell him thanks. Now, with that being said, Phil, you can go ahead and start giving him a bad time now. <laughs> no, I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll, I'll wait. It does scare me a little bit, though. So the Browns beat the Ravens. And it yes, it was with their backup quarterback, quarterback, Phil, and the Ravens lost well, to a one-win team, but I haven't mentioned that at all this morning. I, I get it, but they, it's a new and it scares me, see, because I don't want the Ravens back against the wall, and those AFC North games are nasty regardless of what the records are, and if the Browns have a legitimate quarterback, that scares me too. So everything scares me as a Steelers fan, if you can't tell. I can tell. I want so to go back, Giants scare me. go back to Friday night here for a second. Dylan, what happened uh, from a technical standpoint that messed up the broadcast? Uh, just our, our connection wouldn't go back to the – to the studio the basically. internet connection you mean yeah Wi-Fi? it was just it was just a whole thing so it, it basically we, there was a point where we knew that 
the the regular on site broadcast wasn't gonna happen, so uh, we had to call an audible, and uh, that's what we ended up doing. It, we've done the similar type of broadcast for Shepherd games where the the it'll, the away team doesn't have room for us. We we'll find their stream, put it up on on TV ten, and mm-hmm. commentate it from the studio. So that's kind of what we had to do. Yeah, did you miss any of the game? Uh, I was able to at at least uh, on my way back from the game to the studio listen listen to Nick uh, call it so there was some part of the game I didn't see at that point you know the uh, I don't know 15 minute drive from Spring Mills to the, to right. the studio here so other than that well that's cool well it's you know part- I can say the people at home didn't miss any of the game so which was I mean a terrific job so I mean everybody my wife was like wow they did I mean they on the fly were able to do that just Great job. Part of this Super business job. is thinking quickly on your feet. It's live, and you got to figure and stuff out. Would better would better yeah. broadband Wi-Fi in the, in the state, uh, Dylan, help our broadcasts when we get into places and nights like that? I'm sure it wouldn't hurt. Man, so we're hanging fiber on the poles, they tell us. So maybe in the near future that'll be rectified. Uh, by the way, before we uh, get off of uh, football here, Phil, and I'll, I'll get your prediction on the Steelers game tonight, but. Did you happen to catch the end of the Washington Commanders game yesterday? Right, Bill, I know you did because you I texted did. me yeah. right away as yeah. soon as it happened. I just happened to, I guess, walk. I had the game on. I kind of walked back into the room because I was doing some film work of my own for high school, and uh, I was watching, the, I guess, the last couple minutes of that game. When he heaved that pass, because he kept backing up, I'm like, if he keeps backing up, he's going to be on a range to throw this ball to the end zone. He's running around trying to avoid people. That thing took off in the air, and that – Hail Mary is just the way you draw it up. You put a person in front of the pack, you put a person behind the pack, and you hope that that ball is deflected so that it goes right to one of your people, and it sure did yesterday. That's probably Yeah, I saw the replay of it. And because it's the commanders, I can't give them any credit. They got lucky. <laughs> in, well, in they did. They did, but there is a method to the madness that is the Hail Mary. Yeah, that's why you station yeah, a person is. behind we, the pack. We used to practice it every Thursday. Yeah. Every Thursday we used to practice. It's pretty exciting. You don't see them often, but uh, Baylor beat West Virginia, uh, I think, last year on the very same sort of play, Hail Mary. So when it, when it does work, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. Unless your the other team scores a touchdown. I guess the original Hail Mary was, uh, I think, the one they give credit to is Roger Staubach and Drew Pearson back in the 70s in the Dallas Cowboys-Minnesota Vikings playoff game, although that was just a one-on-one matchup. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's kind of what it got called from that point forward. Then the Falcons in the late seventies won like three games in a season mm. on on those on those passes one year. That was pretty crazy. So you, you know how much I love to fact check Bill. It was at Houston that that beat West Virginia. That's right. Exactly right. Somebody else came in. <laughs> Bill knew it was a Texas team. It was a Texas team, but I know. Uh, uh, Someone else also said Houston, so my mistake, folks. But at right. least you remember they won that one. I also remember West Virginia lost that game. So I was right <laughs> on that part of it. Yes, you did. You got that right. Hey, let's talk, uh, let's talk money here, Phil. Uh, oil had an interesting ride over the weekend because of what happened with Israel and Iran over the weekend. And at one point this morning, oil was down 6%. It started to get, uh, improve a little bit, but now it's still down over 6%. And uh, back under uh, what six, I see now, sixty-seven twenty-seven is the spot price for for oil right now. Uh, I, I'm not sure how much oil matters uh, at this uh, time of the year, and in, in terms of how the economy is moving along. Obviously, when the price goes up a lot, it's an issue for everybody. But six uh, percent drop today. Hopefully, that shows up at the pump real soon. Does is the market going to react based on a, a quick drop in the price of oil, Phil? I don't think so. I don't. I mean, our stock market, no. As long as it's in that range where we're comfortable uh, with the price at the gas pump, and that range is typically around six. Or, as long as it's below eighty, eighty-five dollars a barrel, uh, that typically is okay, and it doesn't have a major impact on market. So it's good that it's fallen, and the reason that it's fallen is good, and and we'll all appreciate it. But I don't know that it makes its way into the, any of the economic reports. Uh, because it hasn't reached, it didn't reach the red level yet. And as the price of oil falls, it's a good reason why it fell. So I don't know that it's going to impact your markets much other than make consumers feel more confident in, in the short term anyway. And we, we, you know, we put a lot of emphasis as, as consumers and investors on oil and food. And we talked about it a lot of late on energy and food. 
but for the economy and our markets, especially right now, how sensitive we are to these economic reports, they really don't play a major role in the main reports that we're getting, So, and that being the inflation reports. Now, there's two inflation reports. There's one with the price of food and oil, and there's one without, and that one without is really what guides uh, the Federal Reserve, which is a big deal, of course, right now, but this week, in, in particular, we have these huge tech earnings, so maybe we can put this Federal Reserve and the CPI and the PPI, all that stuff on the back burner. I welcome that. So we've got a lot of big tech earnings coming up this week, and it was let off last week by a good old Tesla that had a <laughs> banner day and a lot of recovery that happened uh, last week with Tesla. Thank you for pronouncing that correctly <laughs> when you said Tesla. <laughs> I'd just, just say the big T. <laughs> Uh, what, what, what about this controversy with Elon Musk working, uh, allegedly having a job in America when he uh, actually didn't have a valid worker's permit? Have you heard about this, Bill, your guy? Elon yes, Musk? No, no, I haven't. Well, yeah, it was uh, uh, both he and his brother uh, came into the country uh, under a student uh, visa. Stanford, I think. Stanford, yeah, and they, they chose never to attend. And they were, uh, uh, they were working on a, a startup company, which you're prohibited from doing that uh, as an illegal immigrant. And, they, uh, and the fact they were not attending school. So both of them were in the country illegally for something like six to eight years. Uh, his brother has freely admitted that uh, over the years. Uh, Musk has never made a big deal out of it. Uh, I'm not sure there's going to be anything more than just uh, uh, one side uh, uh, trying to throw stones. Uh, but yeah, they were the the provisions at that time were much more relaxed than what they are right now. Uh, so I think they were known as illegal immigrants, but nobody did anything about it. Tesla stock is up a buck fifty at two hundred and seventy dollars and sixty nine cents a share, which I'll remind you, Bill, is about twice the price of when I sold it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hey, Phil, a wise investor is not to follow Rob. <laughs> no, I, think about in, in, I think NVIDIA as well. I think NVIDIA was one of those things. Yeah. No, I never sold NVIDIA. <laughs> I did not sell NVIDIA. I didn't sell a single share of NVIDIA. Well, the big T has been good to me. So, Tesla has doubled since then. So, <clears throat> Wall Street Journal says today, economists warn of new inflation hazards after the election, no matter who wins, that, uh, yeah. that Kamala is going to do, put in a bunch of programs to essentially fuel new construction, funding, you know, a lot of, a lot of public housing, not public housing, but... But as soon as she can, though, if there's, not, if there's not a split Congress. Well, just, yes, the, the, all of this assumes that, and that um, Trump is going to introduce a lot of uh, new tariffs if, if that's the way it works out. So <clears throat> is the Fed, I, I guess, this, if that happens, then the interest rates go back up? Is that and, the, how, how, immune, how immune to political pressures is the Fed on the, on the aftermath know. of elections? Uh, I, they're supposed to be completely immune to it and, and ignore it. And I don't know that that's actually uh, factual, but with policies that may get passed, and I don't know that this is political pressure, but if you're the Federal Reserve and you say, hey, either of those two policies, we've been talking a lot with our clients about this, it doesn't really matter. They both have policies that would in, involve inflationary pressures. Whether or not they pass is a completely different story. So if the Federal Reserve looks at this and says, hey, we've got an, a huge inflationary pressure coming, then I don't know that in the moment that would cause them to increase rates, but it could cause them to pause or go slower on their decrease of rates. Because we've got to remember the two sides of that narrative. Number one is inflation. Now, even though it's not down to their target, it's breathing room, and inflation isn't at a point right now where it's a red alarm. Otherwise, they wouldn't have cut rates uh, like they did at half a percent. But the other side of that narrative is the employment numbers, and that's kind of what they're, they're, they're pandering to right now is the employment numbers. But both of those sides, and you're right that there are a lot of economists to say on both ends that these policies, if they were to get in, put in force, are inflationary pressures and could cause inflation to go up. So I would expect that the Federal Reserve would have a, an ear to that, and maybe re the no reaction would be their reaction, no reaction by way of, 
not decreasing rates as quickly as possible. That was a narrative uh, maybe uh, a week ago was, hey, there, there's two different policies that could cause inflation. And some thought that that's why our market struggled a little bit at the beginning of, of last week. And really for October hadn't been a banner month for sure. But the and, and that was the, the narrative behind that was that there would be a, a higher for longer or it would take longer for them to cut rates because of the potential uh, of, of those policies. And I think it would take the House and the Senate also to be all red or all blue for either of them to pass. But, uh, but that's all yet to be seen. That's one of those unknowns. Phil, uh, last week, uh, Tom Barkin, who's president of the uh, Federal Reserve of Richmond, one of the 12 cardinals of the Federal Reserve, spoke at Shepherd. Did you by chance go to that? No, but my daughter did, and uh, but she and she didn't say much about it, and I wasn't able to. I would have loved to, yeah. but uh, I did not get to attend that. Yeah. I would have loved to, though. What was uh, – you were thought of it uh, because I know you at yeah. least viewed it if you weren't there personally. Yeah, yeah, I I was able to go to it, and I I uh, thought he about for thirty forty minutes he gave just a talk, and then there was another hour, close to an hour of question and answers, and there were several bankers, uh, several financial folks in the audience, and so pretty good questions. Uh, it, he explained how the Fed worked. He explained what some of the inflationary uh, causes and uh, what the Fed could or could not do about it. And he made a comment that the three most pressing inflationary causes, see if I can remember, one was uh, automobile insurance, uh, second was health care, yep. and I'm growing yep. a blank on the third one. But yeah, we talked about all three of them Friday. Yeah, okay. Oh, college tuition prices. Tuition, exactly. College yeah. tuition, exactly. I thought was, I, I would love to see if we can get them on the show, and we're kind of working on that now uh, uh, as a in remote, but it's a, I thought it was a, a very informative discussion. I just wish I knew more about the, uh, the feds and to how they actually work, so I asked more intelligent questions. So. Yeah, and those guys have a very difficult and very important job, and they, they take heat from everybody, and they get blamed for a lot of things, Rob Mario. <laughs> the, uh, but, but at the end what? of the day, they've got two mandates that oppose each other, and, you know, inflationary pressures and employment numbers, and those two things uh, oppose each other, and they're dealt with the jungle, juggling of that. So when you say, like, what's the cause of inflation, that's a huge debate right now. It's a huge political debate as well, but what's the cause of inflation? Well, these are the items, and I, and I had a discussion on uh, via va Facebook with with uh, a listener not too long ago. But when you go into what you just said, notice that he didn't say food and energy. Food and energy is removed from uh, from a lot of that, and food and energy prices have moderated. They haven't went the other way, but they've moderated. So, but but those those other parts of aspects of our economy that we don't talk about much. Have you? Has anyone looked at their automobile insurance of late? Yes. I, you know, I, I've, I know. I look at mine. It's nasty. It is terrible. How much it costs us to uh, to insure automobiles for a family of four right now with uh, with a 21 year old and a teenage daughter, and then of course my wife and I. It's unbelievable. It's one of our largest expenses is automobile insurance. But what is the consumer to do about that? other than just pay it, and that's part of the issue. And it's not just automobile insurance. And I've said one of the biggest reasons for inflation through all this all this period is the consumer. There's some cases where the consumer can't help it. Now, we think of life-saving medicines. can't do anything about that. But you also can't do anything about auto insurance and, and for the most part, college education as well. Bill, we are out of time, and I would appreciate it if you would give us some of yours by telling us how we get in touch with you today. You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue or right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Oh, real quick, your Steelers pick tonight. 26-10. to 10. We have an offense now with the quarterback, and our defense is going to step up. Go Steelers. All right. Thank you, Phil. Have a great day, sir. Thank you, guys. You can catch uh, Phil in two minutes previewing the day's business news each weekday morning at 638, replayed at 738.